This is the first in a series on contracts. We're going to begin by looking at the aspect of contract law known as formation. But first, we're going to start by looking at the underlying theory of contracts and contract law and look at a simple definition of what a contract is. After that, we're going to look at some of the structural aspects and requirements for a contract to come into existence. Firstly, the form, and then the seven elements that must be present for a contract to come into existence. When we're looking at the underlying theories behind what a contract is and what contract law is, these theories sort of categorize themselves into four broad areas. The first, probably the most straightforward, is what we call bargain theory. And that's the idea that two or more people come together, negotiate and thrash out what it is that each is going to give to the other. And this idea that this each side exchanges promises through the process of negotiation and they give something known as consideration as the price for that particular bargain. Economic theories, sort of in contrast, really aren't concerned about individual bargains that people make. Instead, they look at the overall benefit or utility across many people coming together and having transactions, each in theory exchanging something of less value than the thing in which they're receiving. And the idea there being that if everybody does this and there are many, many, many transactions that are formed, in theory, when you enter into a transaction, you want something that's going to make you happier and the other party is doing the same thing. And so the fundamental, um, I guess, aim or purpose of this economic theory of contract law is that if, assuming we reduce the underlying transaction costs for doing and making these exchanges, we want lots of them to happen. And if that occurs, in theory, everyone in society is going to be better off. The third area, this idea of agency, it's quite unrelated to the um, legal or contractual concept of agency. Really what these types of theories are looking at is that contract law and this um, concept of obligation, people being obliged to do things for other people, is as an expression of their own free will. People come together, make contracts, make bargains, make uh, arrangements and agreements, and then choose to give up something in order to do that. A again, this promising to do something or being obliged to do something uh, forms the, the basis of, of consideration. But fundamentally, the agency theories of contract are that we enter into these arrangements as an expression of our individual free will. Finally, the broad area known as the social aspects or theories of contract law is really a series of theoretical frameworks that acknowledge that we live and exist in society and that there are certain structures that are in place and these are there to be acknowledged. Um, some social theories of contract and contract law have specific names, Marxist theory for example, or um, feminist or post-structural or post-colonial concepts of bargaining, and they're quite uh, different in terms of each of them, how they, uh, they sort of function or operate. But fundamentally, this group of theories of contract law acknowledges that we aren't just the mere product of this individual free will and that we live and we've grown up with and we must be responsive to and acknowledge the society and the power dimensions and structures that exist in that. Contract law can really be thought about as four distinct but quite interrelated areas. Formation, terms, vitiating factors, and discharge. Now, each of these four th 
things, four areas, represents a different aspect that we will analyze uh, a particular contract. Formation being looking at when a contract comes together, when it comes into existence. The analysis of terms is after we accept that there is a contract, what is it that the parties are going to do as a result? Vitiating factors are, okay, if we have a contract, it does exist, we know what has to be done. How can we get out of this contract? Um, how can we modify or change what we have to do in terms of either to perform or to somehow undo this particular contract? And discharge is how a, a contract comes to an end, either through aspects of performance or through uh, other mechanical aspects of law or frustration. The remainder of this recording is devoted to contract formation, and it must be stated from the outset that, in legal practice, the existence of a contract is very rarely in doubt. Of the four areas of contract law that we look at, this is the one that is least likely, usually, to actually arise. Often parties know that there is a contract, they're more concerned about what it is that they have to do, how they can get out of it, and what it's going to cost them as a re result of breach. Now there are many definitions for what a contract is. I've looked far and wide to try and find the absolute barest minimum, the simplest possible definition we could have for a contract. And fundamentally, a contract is an agreement that can be enforced. It is something about parties coming together, promising to do something, and that having legal consequences. From time to time, you may hear the expression that contracts need to be in writing to somehow be enforced, and that's something of a myth. Contracts can be in writing, and in fact, as uh, legal professionals, we're always advised to, to our clients to put things into writing. Why? Because writing and written documents are the best evidence that you can adduce when things are going to court. Um, but contracts don't have to be in writing. They can be uh, oral, just spoken between two people, sometimes with a handshake, although that's certainly not um, mandated. They can also be uh, in the writing in the form of electronic communications. Contracts can also uh, be a combination of written aspects as well as oral ones. And there can also uh, have this area where contracts can be implied from the conduct of parties, particularly those with, um, with repeat business. It's important to note at this stage, though, that there are some statutory rules that step in and say that certain types of contracts must be in writing. And the most famous of those uh, was mandated in this old, old piece of legislation called the Statute of Frauds that says, quite simply, contracts for the sale and transfer of land must be in writing. There are also some other instruments, contracts of insurance and guarantees and such like, which must be in writing as well. But by no means this is a mandatory requirement for simple contracts between parties. Because we're looking at contract formation, that is, a contract coming into existence, it's important at this stage to talk about what we call at law the elements of a contract. Elements are things that must be proven to a court of law in order to tick the box or to prove a particular point to the court in order to move on to any next stage. For example, if you were bringing an action into a court for uh, the other side's breach of a contract, you would need to first prove that there was a contract between the parties. In order to do that, you have to satisfy these points at law. A contract must have an offer. That offer has to be accepted. Consideration must flow between the parties. There must be the intention to create legal relations. The parties must be legally capable of entering into a contract. There must be mutual understanding of the underlying subject matter, terms and modes of performance, and the contract has to have an aspect of legality. 
in some textbooks and indeed in some cases. You may find the elements of a contract phrased in slightly different ways. Sometimes, for example, formation, which is the offer and acceptance component, is sort of lumped in together. Some books will group the elements in terms of the physical ones, the offer, acceptance, and consideration, and analyze those separately from the mental elements, the intention and the mutuality, uh, and again, also separated from the essentially legal uh, elements, which is the capacity and legality components of that. Some texts will also, where you see the mutuality element, will express that in terms of certainty. In other words, are the parties certain about the terms of the contract and the underlying subject matter and the identity of each other when entering into a contract? Now, fundamentally, though, it really doesn't matter uh, the way that these things are structured. Um, this is the conventional way, the seven elements we have there that we've followed for this particular subject. And generally, the key uh, aspects of the elements of a contract aren't really so much in dispute. And that means that it doesn't matter whether or not it's referred to as the formation or the formative uh, elements. The idea of the offer and the idea of the acceptance, for example, even expressed in a slightly different way by different judges, is still fundamentally referring to the same thing. So we'll kick things off by looking at the first element, which is the offer. In order to start a contract, one party, one side, needs to make an offer. Now, this term offer or contractual offer that we use in law um, it can really be used in two different ways. Uh, the first is when you actually do the offering. It's the promise to do something. When a person does that with the, this clear, unequivocal intention to become bound through doing that, we call that the offer. That is, the person is making an offer. Um, the offer, though, when we can refer to it, um, and consequently, it can also refer to the statement itself. And again, this is this clear, unequivocal statement of the things that the party offering is promising to be bound by. And as part of this offer, you also express what the other side is to be bound by as well. That's a, an important component of the offer element of a contract. The case citation there, Australian Woolen Mills and the Commonwealth, was... Uh, the High Court discussing actual fundamental rules of contract and contract law. Uh, there, the Wool Board had or had received a subsidy uh, during the war from the Commonwealth Government. And the High Court was essentially charged with the task of trying to determine whether or not the uh, issuing of the subsidy constituted an offer. And they said no. No, it's merely an aspect of government policy to do the subsidy and did not constitute a legal offer uh, sufficient for a, a contract to arise in that instance. And so some things to note about offers uh, here. First of all, offers can be made to the world at large. And in the famous case of Carlisle and the Carbolic Smokeball Company, uh, the Smokeball Company put out a series of ads and in those ads they said we will give a hundred pounds to anyone who uses our product and gets the flu and so Mrs Carlisle bought the product used it still got the flu and went to claim her hundred pounds and among many arguments that the smoke wall company uh, put up one of them was that look this actually wasn't an offer capable of being um, accepted and the, the court disagreed on that count. They said, no, actually, you can have offers that can be made to the world and be capable of being accepted, usually through some form of performance. And in that situation, yes, by going buying the product and using it in a certain way, you have accepted this particular, or Mrs. Carla has accepted this offer that was placed out uh, by, uh, by Smokeball. Now, this should be contrasted with uh, most advertisements 
which in terms of contract law are generally referred to as invitations to treat. What does that mean? It means that the advertisement that goes out to a person uh, is an invitation for them to come and make an offer back to the business selling the product. In the case of the Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain and Boots, there the uh, chain of chemists had moved to this uh, fancy new style model of having a, a self-serve store, which seems quite natural and ordinary to us in the 21st century, but that was a relatively recent invention. And so the argument here was that there, there was going to be some form of breach of uh, legislative requirements that um, that only chemists were to issue certain certain things and the and there was uh, I believe some some form of sanctions that that would have arisen um, if the contract was formed uh, however uh, the court in that case said look no when a person goes picks up the product from the shelf they're not accepting the offer they are going to the uh, to the cashier and offering to then buy the product for the usually for that price advertised it's at that point in time that the offer is made and if the cashier uh, accepts which usually they do so when the person profits some money that is the point in time where the contract will arise now similarly in uh, Fisher and Bell uh, there there was an advertisement in the window of a store for uh, a flick knife and this form of knife, you, you know, again, you couldn't uh, sell these things directly. And they were just trying to determine how and where the contract was formed. And uh, again, the, the court in that case did determine that it's when a person goes to buy the item, they see the advertisement first. That is not an offer. It is when the person goes inside and, profits, uh, and tries to pay, they are bringing, usually taking that item to the, to the counter, tendering the money that is the point in time where the offer is made and usually if accepted by the cashier that's the point in time in which the contract concludes and and both an offer and an invitation to trade have to be distinguished from the concept of puff puff is a technical contract law term used to describe a statement or representation that's been made by a company usually to brand or differentiate a product in some way that is exaggerated or silly so much so that no reasonable person would ever consider it to have any form of sort of legal status or legal effect in this situation where something is puff it's not an invitation treat and it's not certainly not an offer and the case example there is actually an american case uh, where there was an advertisement by pepsi on the tv in the early 90s for uh people to collect points through um, through purchasing bottles of Pepsi and if one was to acquire a large quantity of points say 7 million points then you could um, apply to Pepsi to exchange those for a Harrier jet now a couple of things came from that first of all the small number of points say the 200 points for the jacket the 50 points for the sunglasses these small quantities of um of points that were required for things were um not considered to be any form of puff they were perfectly reasonable statements to make um, that customers could quite be reasonably expected to go fulfill those conditions and be able to claim their their price in pepsi the difficulty was the seven million points now <laughs> the real difficulty came from this and pepsi kind of recognized this point they didn't put the right number on they actually rerun the ad at some stage later after this was pointed out after mr leonard uh, applied paid the uh, 10 cents per uh, point that they that they needed so the seven hundred uh, thousand dollars and asked for a harrier jet um, at that point, Pepsi immediately changed the ad and changed it to 700 million points. So something that couldn't realistically or really be um, be done without spending s sort of 70 million dollars rather than 700,000. 
Um, nonetheless, this did go through to an intermediate level uh, court and it did get dismissed. Um, but the key part that flows from this, and it's one of the more um, entertaining cases in, that comes up in, in contract law, is that if you're going to make a claim that you believe to be exaggerated or silly, make sure it is really, really silly. And that you know, reasonable people couldn't actually think that it might have had some semblance of truth uh, as part of it. So it's something of a lesson, I guess, for those that, uh, that have to do advertising and marketing for firms at some stage in their careers. Another thing to note about uh, contractual offers is that an auction, and auctions are actually a, a little bit murky in terms of the underlying law behind them, but the key part, and it flows from, from some pretty old cases, is that if you attend an auction, the auctioneer making a call for bids, asking for people to bid, is not an offer itself, okay? But when you place a bid, you are the party making an offer to the auctioneer to purchase the particular thing that's being auctioned for the amount that you are bidding. Now similarly, the call for tenders, that's where a large packet of work is put out, often by government agencies, large entities, asking for businesses to supply a particular uh, area of expertise, so um, construction being a good example. These calls for tenders in themselves are not usually offers. Uh, the case there, Blackpool and uh, the Feld, uh, Blackpool and Feld Aero Club, and the Blackpool Borough Council, in this case, and there the court went through in detail, like that, and explained that look, you could have a situation where a tender that is going out, where it's carefully mapped out exactly what the parties. Um, seeking to apply or returning or putting in these tenders, um, if you carefully map out exactly what they have to do, you can turn this into an offer. In other words, if we clearly map out and say, we will take the, um, we will, we bind ourselves to take the, uh, the lowest bid that meets this, 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 and this requirement, um, that can be, but generally they are not. Generally, a call for tenders is not an offer. It is an invitation for these entities to make offers back to the um, party um, calling for tenders. Another thing to note with contractual offers, and this is a pretty important rule, is that if you make a contractual offer, say, to buy a particular object or thing at a, at a, a certain price, and the other side comes back with a counter offer. Important rule in contract law is that a counter offer actually negates the original offer. So here, for example, in Hyde and Ranch, we had a, a party seeking to purchase a, a packet of land. Now there was an original uh, request and say, hey, look, um, I'll offer to sell you my land for uh, 1200 pounds um, that was rejected and then they came, they came back a little bit later so okay how about a thousand and then that was rejected but it wasn't rejected out of hand what we said is what the other side said was look oh, how about 950 and when that was refused nope i'm not going to do 950 oh well okay well i'll accept your thousand then and this went off to court and the court said no when you came back and you offered 950 you negated that original offer from the other party of a thousand. You, in essence, when you do the counter offer, you become the offeror and they are the offeree. They're the ones that need to accept it. And the moment you do that, in our system of contract law, that original offer from them is gone. That's an important thing to note for your um, the clients. And again, in, in professional practice, that when offers are going backwards and forwards between parties, counter offers negate existing or standing offers from the other party. It's also important to note that two parties can be both making an offer at the same time. 
In other words, you could both send, for example, an email each to the other person without knowing usually of the first offer that's already coming towards you. And sometimes those uh, those two offers may be in the same terms. Usually they're not. Where this can be a, a bit of a problem is particularly with large, you know, medium to large entities where there are standard forms. And so in Butler Machine Call Tool and uh, XLO, there was a standard form in other words, a, um, a standardized document for ordering products from one entity, and the other entity had a standardized product for accepting of offers. And the issue was there, well, if these are in conflict, which one's going to win? And there the court said, well, fundamentally, where you've got these, uh, the standardized form for, for the offer and standardized form for the acceptance, that second part, the acceptance document, which then goes back to the, the original offer or is actually the offer itself. And we sort of think about that. I think, well, it's kind of like a system where you have essentially made counter offers as part of this process. And so when things are in dispute, it is the party that it looks like at face value accepting the contract. But when they do that on you know, substantially different terms because their documents are different, it's that document that's going to trump. So the next thing to look at is how long will an offer stay open? Do they stay open forever or are they finite in some way? And you probably guess that it's it's definitely in that latter category. And offers can be cancelled. They can come in to an end in a variety of ways. The first, most commonly, is revocation of the offer. I offered a particular thing uh, or uh, to have a contract on particular terms I can give notice that I'm revoking that uh, that offer. I can give notice to the parties, and importantly, give notice only before they've accepted that particular offer. Uh, another one offer is cancelled is if it is rejected. The other side come back and say, no, we don't like that. Or, and again, as previously uh, mentioned, a counter offer will automatically cancel uh, an offer that you issue. Uh, another is the lapse of time. The offers just don't stay open forever. The courts, looking at all the circumstances of the uh, particular offer, and what it's for, uh, and the circumstances that it's made, they basically just determine it has to be open for a reasonable length of time. And that's if time isn't already stipulated. It's possible when you have an offer to state this must this offer must be accepted before a certain point in time. Uh, another time an offer can come to an end is where there's a change of material circumstances, often to do with the underlying subject matter itself. For example, uh, an offer to, to sell a boat that's passed out and given to somebody, but before it's been accepted, the boat known to both parties has been completely destroyed. Um, that's a fundamental change in circumstances that we're all aware of. And there's some other areas of contract law are impinged by um, this destruction of the subject matter uh, later. But assuming that uh, the potential parties to a contract know about this, that's a fundamental change in the circumstances and the offer will automatically come to an end. Another way it can come uh, to an end is if there's a failure of a condition. If a certain thing has to happen um, in order for the offer to be accepted and that thing is that either hasn't happened or can't happen, then the offer just disappears. It's cancelled. Um, the incapacity on behalf of the offeror. Now, if a person um, makes a contractual offer to another party, and much like um, sort of the failure of condition or change in circumstances, the person making the offer becomes incapacitated before the offer has been accepted, then by default, that offer again is, becomes um, inoperable, becomes incapable of being accepted. Similarly, if the offeror uh, dies. Now, there's a little bit of conjecture about this, uh, particularly where an, an offer that's been made that is still capable of being um, facilitated and done by the estate of, of a person who does die. Um, certainly, contracts for things like personal services, I, I, I offer to go and mow your lawns. Before I um, you accept that offer, I die. That is something that can't be fulfilled, and so that'll automatically cancel that offer. 
Um, but certain other things, the courts have been happy to accept. Um, so contracts for the sale of land, for example, uh, that's something that can be continued after a person, the offeror, um, does actually pass away. And with the executor or trustee of the um, person's estate um, stepping in and um, and really carrying on in the shoes of the of the deceased party. The next element to look at is acceptance of a contractual offer. And here, the key part is that in acceptance of an offer is clearly expressed intention to be legally bound by the terms that the offeror has stated without modification. The case citation there, Feldhaus and Bindley, involved, like a lot of contract law cases, actually involved a, a racehorse. And in that situation, uh, the, it was actually an, a nephew and an uncle. The nephew had a horse, the uncle wished to purchase it, and he'd send notice to him and to the, um, and the, the horse was actually held by Bindley, who was a, uh, an auctioneer, gave notice this to the nephew stating, uh, I wish to purchase that horse, and if I don't hear back from you, I'm going to consider the horse mine at 30 pounds and 15 shillings. And he didn't hear back from the nephew and the auctioneer accidentally sold the horse to a, a third party and so the issue that was, went to court was that well was there a contract and there they said well no because there was no clear statement back from the nephew saying that he accepted the offer you can't state in an offer that if, if the, i hear nothing from you if in other words there's silence that I will just deem that contract to come into existence. You can't do that. Um, and so that's also um, really authority for this proposition, that silence usually, uh, unless you've got some unusual series of uh, circumstance and conduct, usually with repeated business, silence on its own um, can't usually accept uh, a contract. Really the takeaway from this though, is that acceptance needs to be communicated back to the offeror and the offeror can stipulate certain modes or ways that a contract can be accepted and they can make those quite narrow in terms of how a particular contractual offer um, needs to be accepted in by certain modes from the person doing the accepting but silence is not going to be sufficient you can't state I will deem a contract to be in existence if I don't hear back from you. It has to come in some form of words or actions or conduct. Now, the offeror though, they can elect as part of this to waive the need from communication back to the other party. So in other words, the, um, the party that is seeking to accept the offer, if the offeror has said, oh, we don't need to hear back from you, then that's fine. It's kind of like a, a double chance, really, from the person accepting the contract. The person offering can't unilaterally create a contract by stipulating that um, if we don't hear back from you, a contract comes into existence. But they can say, um, you don't need to get back to us if you do accept uh, that particular contract. There are a host of other things though, rules to do with contractual uh, acceptance to go through. And the first of those is that offer and acceptance can happen at the same time. And in fact, it often does. Essentially when you purchase from a supermarket, when you take the goods to the checkout, and sometimes we can even use the self-service checkout lanes. And when we beat the products through, the contract doesn't come into existence, though, until we offer valid payment. Even a declined credit card isn't going to be sufficient for a contract to come into existence. So essentially, performance of the contract, from at least from our perspective, happens at the same time. It is executed. Now, in Thornton and Shoe Lane Parking, uh, that was, again, quite a famous case in... Um, in uh, contract law that was to do 
with these new fangled and fancy parking ticket machines. Now, up until the uh, sort of late 60s, when you went to park your car and to pay money, there would be a person present. And you would essentially pay money to the person and they would usually let you out of that particular parking place. Or you'd pay as you'd go in. And there were a variety of systems that were in place to do that. But as Lord Denning pointed out, with these newfangled ticketing machines, you can't negotiate with it. You can't bargain with it. You can't do anything. The contract has to come into existence and be completed at the point of time whereby the ticket is issued. And so in that situation, that is the point in time where the contract is both accepted and performed. Similarly, in uh, Manufacturers Mutual and John Boardman, um, the High Court there said that, look, you can stipulate in the contract, you're perfectly entitled to stipulate that the method of accepting a particular contract is payment. Um, again, much like going into the local uh, sort of supermarkets to do such things, uh, businesses and insurance companies and such like can do these things and have these modes of acceptance as part of a contract as well. It used to be an old standing rule that when one party starts to perform on a contract, that that would demonstrate that they'd accepted that contract. And that was uh, analysed by the federal court, Mobile Oil and Lindell Nominees, and really reworded and reworked to some extent. Partial performance doesn't automatically demonstrate that you've accepted a particular contractual offer that's been made to you. In the mobile oil case, uh, franchisees of uh, who ran mobile service stations uh, were participating in a, a system of excellence uh, or a scheme of some sort that mobile themselves were operating. And there, as part of a class action, they tried to argue that the, the existence of that and, and them starting to perform towards it was then uh, accepting a particular offer. And the federal court there said no. No, it's not a hard and fast rule. Each um, instance of this needs to be examined on the particular facts. Finally, a restatement of the competing standard forms from the Excello case, that where you've got two parties that one makes an offer in a standard form and the other one accepts it on a standard form, those are considered to be cross offers. That um, the form and the document, the standard form that of acceptance is going to really be the offer for a new uh, contract and so that it's important to note in that situation that by accepting on substantially different uh, terms than what the offer was you you're going back to the early part you're just negating the original offer and you become the new offerer they are the ones that need to accept it now there is a rule in contract law i like to consider the worst rule in contract um Others seem to be a fan of it, and it really it exists in a historical context. Pragmatically, the courts of common law developed a rule that says where you have a contract that's capable of being accepted by the telegram or by post, it is deemed to be accepted when the letter accepting the contract is put into the mailbox, not when it's received. Now, it's an old rule, it flows from a case called Adams and Linsell from 1818, um, but it is still law, but it's really, really narrow. And in the 20th century, uh, this came into some of the superior courts and they, they really reduced the scope of this postal acceptance rule and said, first of all, it doesn't apply to facsimile and telex machines. In that situation, where and this occurred in the Antares in Miles Far East, as well as Brinkibon and Stahl Starleg. Um, acceptance where you've got newfangled 20th century technology it only occurs upon the other side actually receiving the particular communication postal acceptance rule does not apply um, in the 21st century we have legislation uh, which helps guide us on this uh, and so really for email and instant messengers um, sms and such like acceptance uh, is deemed under the uh, section 24 of our electronic transactions act in queensland seems is deemed to occur when a message becomes capable of being retrieved in the case of email that is when it 
it enters the mail server of the other side. That's the point in time whereby a, um, a particular contract is deemed to be accepted. And the postal acceptance rule does not apply. The next element is consideration. Consideration is the price of the promise that each party gives as part of entering into contractual arrangements. In Curry and Mesa, uh, the court there uh, stated that consideration is some right, interest, profit or benefit accruing to one party or some forbearance, some detriment, some loss or responsibility given, suffered or undertaken by the other. And so fundamentally it's something you give um, to give benefit to the other side or something that you lose in order to somehow um, the other side gets benefit from that. Now, the court in Curry in Mesa, um, as part of this determination, which involved um, bills of exchange and the one bank deciding not to honor a check. And the court was looking at, well, where you have a situation where the check is dishonored, can that be good consideration for a contract? And the answer is no. And that's an important thing to note in practice where you issue a check and these become less and less common in the um, 21st century. But it's important to note when you do issue something with a check and you pay or profit or offer to pay with a, um, with a check, if it is dishonored, in theory, you haven't offered consideration as part of the contract. And that can be really important when we come to remedies later on because no contract comes into existence. You can't offer a dud check as consideration for a contract. Another thing to note here is that under our system, consideration needs to be sufficient, but it doesn't have to be adequate. What does that mean? It has to be something of value in the eyes of the law, but it doesn't have to have fundamentally intrinsic worth. And the case there, Chapel and Co. Uh, and Nessa is involves the, a scheme where Nestle would uh, exchange or give some form of benefit if they received in the mail a, a quantity of chocolate bar wrappers. And as part of this dispute, Nestle argued that the chocolate bar wrappers don't form part of valid consideration because they're worthless. And the court said, no, no, you do get, you get some form of benefit from the other side giving you those chocolate bars, usually in the form that, hey, they've had to have bought your chocolate in order to do that. And so the fact that the wrappers themselves are simply thrown out doesn't stop this from being valid consideration. In fact, the famous line in Chapel and Nestle is that a peppercorn is sufficient consideration for a contract. Another thing to note about consideration is that it has to flow from the person promising it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be directed at the other party. For example, I could enter into a contract um, paying another person or supplying goods to another person for them to do something or give some form of benefit to a third party, um, my son or my partner. For example, one of the slightly problematic things about that, though, is that it's still me who entered into that particular contract. So in the example of me paying for something or offering some form of consideration to another party for them to give the benefit, say, to, um, to my child, the child could sue on that contract. Only I can. They are not what's called privy to this particular contract, even though they receive the benefit from it. Only parties to a contract under this concept of the doctrine of privity can sue or be sued on that particular contract. Finally, the idea of illusory consideration, that is consideration which is fundamentally valueless is not valid and this can arise in situations where you 
offer to usually to not do something that you weren't going to do anyway. Another key aspect of the element of consideration is that past consideration is not good consideration. What does that mean? It means that if a person does something or has done something in the past, either through the payment of money, the supplying of goods, or choosing to refrain from certain things, if that has been done and then you decide to form a contract, the things that have been done can't be used as consideration in the bargain that we're making right now. Similarly, if you are under an existing duty to do something, just reaffirming that you're going to do that exact same duty is not going to be good consideration for a new contract. The example here of Stilken Merrick involved sailors traveling um, under a, a contract of service from India to the United Kingdom. And when the ship got to South Africa, a bunch of sailors deserted. And so the shipmaster said to the uh, crew, look, we'll pay you more money if you stick with us and carry on doing what you said you were going to do. So then the ship made it back to England. They demanded their money and the, uh, the captain said no. And in fact, the courts also said no. The reason for that is that the people were already under a contractual duty. It's not good consideration to just do what you said you were already going to do as a basis for a new contract. However, as something of an exception to this, if you do do something and you have done something in the past, but you expected and both parties anticipated that it would be remunerated in some way and then you go to make an agreement later on, that actually can be, as an exception to this idea of past consideration, um, that can be used as part of the consideration element of a new contract. The next thing to look at, and this is a very, very old rule, is what we call the rule in Pennell's case. In Pennell's case, it was decided that at common law, the partial payment of money to try and pay off a debt can never be consideration as an agreement to pay off the debt in entirety. What does that mean? It means that if I owe someone $1,000 and I offered to pay $700 in full satisfaction of that debt, I can certainly pay them the money, but a contract can never come into existence. Why? Because the part payment of that entire debt in order to discharge the whole can never be used as consideration for that particular arrangement. The next thing to look at is actually an equitable principle. You may recall from earlier recordings that equity is a set of rules and principles that operates in the, our court system in order to mitigate the underlying harshness of common law rules. And this area of equity uh, in relation to consideration is this concept of promissory estoppel. And this is a rule that says, look, as an exception to the common law requirement of consideration, where there is a situation where a contract would otherwise arise, but for whatever reason, it doesn't. Usually because there's some form of defect, um, as it in terms of consideration, or because of some form of statutory rule that prevents a contract from coming into place. And one side has changed their positions, usually spent money, materially altered their position, and it's impossible to undo the state of affairs. Equity can intervene to stop an injustice from occurring. And the famous case for this is Central London Property Trust and the High Trees. This is a case involving a block of flats and the, the owner of the block and the, uh, like a lessee, who in turn um, leased out, uh, out these flats to, um, to tenants. And in this situation, there was a war. During the Second World War, um, they couldn't 
that the people who were running the flats couldn't get enough tenants in. So they went to the owners and said, hey, look, can we please have a reduction in rent? Otherwise, we're just going to go broke. Or we're just going to, we're not going to be able to survive the war. And we're not going to be able to get tenants in at this particular rate. So, and the, so they, the owner said, oh, okay, sure, that's fine. We'll lower the rent for the duration of the war. And that was fine. Now, after the war, the owner turned around and said, oh, no, actually, we would like all that money back now. And the... Um, sort of the tenants here, they were in something of a bind because, strictly speaking, they were under an existing contractual duty to um, to pay the higher rate of rent. There, however, um, Lord Denning stepped in and mapped out this area known as permissory estoppel and noted that it's only going to apply in situations where there is this material alteration of position, um, an impossibility, to sort of go back on um, to restore the parties to where they were and it has to be an unfair unjust result um, essentially for the person who promised to do something even the in the absence of consideration and then's reneging upon that promise in australia this was mapped out by the australian high court in walton stores and interstate in maha there a construction company was and had been negotiating to um, do some construction work. Uh, unbeknownst to them, though, there was a defect that sent the contract uh, off to the supermarket chain, but there'd been some form of defect, some statutory defect in it, and the construction work, however, had started. So the again, the situation where we believe that there's a contract. And we've materially altered our position. We've put money in, we've knocked buildings down, we've started building this new building. And the other side in that dispute, they knew that there was a defect and they just decided to wait eight weeks before telling the other side. And again, the High Court in Australia jumped in and said, look, under this um, principle of estoppel, where one side has materially altered the, um, his, his or her position and there's going to some grave injustice is going to occur as a result. Equity can intervene in that situation to prevent this injustice from occurring. Similarly, when one party actively assures the other that they won't rely on certain um, statutory mechanisms or rights that are open to them, and the other side um, um, relies on that particular promise, and in the case of uh, Commonwealth and Verwayan, um, this was a it was actually a tort case involving the liability for a um a crash involving the uh, hmas voyager it had a crash many many years earlier i believe in the 1950s and the commonwealth has said they won't rely on the statute of limitations and then later on when uh, verwayne started to make a claim the commonwealth essentially reneged on that promise and there again the high court stepped in and said look equity intervenes in the situation when you renege on what you said you were going to do even in the absence of a, um, a formal common law structured contract the next thing we want to look at is deeds now a deed is a document which essentially acts as a mechanism for bypassing consideration to all of the rules that we've just explained about this essential requirement of consideration for a contract can be bypassed. And the reason it can do that is because Parliament said so. There is a statutory mechanism for bypassing consideration. Why would you want to do this? Well, there are some situations where you want to be able to execute a particular deed and then just swap them over um, to be done at different times. And there are also some circumstances where uh, a party might enter into an arrangement where they're only going to get some form of detriment. Where might this be? For example, a parent offering to become guarantor on a loan for a child. In that situation, in theory, the parent's not getting any benefit from this at all. Uh, the only thing they're going to get is some form of detriment if the child uh, defaults on the um, mortgage. 
So the key thing to note here uh, about deeds is that essentially they become binding on the person entering into it. And it's a very solemn process. It requires a, um, uh, a witness. It's got to be signed. And um, they, in fact, they use the expression signed, sealed and delivered like the song. Um, and the reason for that is that entering into a deed is, uh, is it needs to be done of utmost care. And as a result, though, when you um, do enter into a deed at common law, you actually become um, bound by whatever's in the deed at the point in time where it's been signed, sealed and delivered to the other party. Even if the other side to a particular arrangement may also be entering into a deed. Um, so essentially, it's almost like you've got two agreements, contractual agreements, um, and in each of those agreements, you're bypassing consideration with the use of deeds. But just be mindful of this. When you enter into a deed, from that point, you become bound. Once that you have entered it, you've signed it, it's been witnessed, and you've delivered it to the other party. You're bound under the conditions of what are in that solemn document. Lastly, it's important to note from a legal perspective that it is commonplace for one party when agreeing to not bring an action against the other is for that party to uh, enter into a deed in order to do that. Essentially to state, I forgo all rights under a particular set of circumstances uh, to sue you. Usually there is a, um, this is a settlement of some sort. So there's usually some form of um, monetary uh, money's exchanged in some way. But the default mechanism for sort of saying no is to enter into that deed and having that pass. So just um, be aware of the fact that that deed is considered to be um, entered into at the point in time where it gets delivered to the other side. And it doesn't operate like a normal contract. The next element of contracts is intention. Now this intention to form legal relations must be present when an arrangement is made. Otherwise, it, it, the agreement is not going to be binding at law. Now, there used to be a reasonably hard and fast rule that there was a presumption that between family members, a contract would not be found, whereas between non-family members, by default, there would be a contract. And the High Court in Australia, an in, homogenous in and Greek Orthodox community, re-examined that role in 2002, and they said, well, no. No, what you need to do is to look at the underlying facts of the arrangement and just objectively uh, determine this. It's not going to be a hard and fast rule that family members will always be one way and non-family members will not. We need to look at the underlying facts and just make this determination. So is the arrangement what the two parties want it to be? Well, no, not really. It's what the parties objectively intended for the particular arrangement to be. If they intended for it to have legal consequences and we can look at the facts to determine that, then it'll be a contract. If they didn't, then it won't be. Now, contracts or rather arrangements and agreements can have an honor clause. And in Rosen Frank and J.R. Compton and brothers, there was a clause in the agreement that says, look, this is not a contract. This is just an honorable arrangement between two parties not intended to have any legal consequences. And the courts in that case said, yeah, fair enough. You can do that. Uh, we're not going to do anything about it now that you're here, of course, but parties can agree between themselves for a particular contract to not have consequences. But appreciate that if it's not a contract and the parties agree for there not to have any consequences, then neither side can go complaining if there's a, a defect afterwards through the courts. And importantly, this is very distinct and different from a clause in an actual contract that says, if there is a dispute, the parties can't go to the courts. Clauses like that are, um, are actually uh, a void and they are usually struck out by the courts themselves. 
the next element to look at is capacity. Now by default, um, adults entering into arrangements at arm's length between each other are going to be deemed to have capacity. In fact, all adults by default, after the age of 18, on your 18th birthday, you are able to enter into contracts. You have sui juris, you have standing fully in the eyes of the law. Uh, however, there are some situations where individuals and groups don't have the full features of um, legal capacity. And the classic situation is with minors. Now, people can contract with minors. You can sell a chocolate bar to a 17-year-old, and that can have legal effect. But you probably couldn't sell a personal computer to a 17-year-old. Or rather, you could sell it to them. But if they haven't paid you, you won't be able to go to the courts and enforce that. So part of this element in terms of capacity in relation to minors is that it gives the minor the uh, essentially the benefit. They get it both ways. They can't have contracts enforced against them unless those contracts fall within two specific types. And the first of those types are contracts for the necessities of life. What's that? Food, shelter, um, transport, possibly mobile phones in this day and age. Things that um, objectively a, a particular minor would need to function as a normal member of the community. The other type of contract that can be enforced against a minor are what's called beneficial contracts uh, for service. A minor, a 16 year old, is allowed to have a job and that contract can be enforced both ways. So that if a, um, a particular uh, minor uh, is seeking to have an aspect of that contract enforced, usually payment, but uh, occasionally other aspects, leave and such like, then that is a fully functioning contract. It's an exception to this rule whereby um, minors can only co um, have contracts enforced one way. Another rule to do with capacity is to do with mental infirmity and intoxication. And the default rule, going back a very long time to Beverly's case in 1603, is too bad. Intoxication or mental infirmity or illness will not usually impact the formation of a contract. In other words, it's not going to impede this element of capacity when the parties come together to make the contract. Now, there are some exceptions to this, and these exceptions, though, we usually analyze under other areas of contract law, in particular the vitiating factors, which I'll discuss in another recording. Suffice to say here, though, that the rules with intoxication and um, mental infirmity or disability for contract law is much, much tougher on the intoxicated person or the mentally infirm person than other areas of law, in particular the criminal law. The criminal law does actually offer you some, not a great, but some aspect of partial defense or excuse, or at least taking into account the underlying intoxication or mental um, state that a person uh, may have been when committing criminal offenses. Not so with contract law. Contract law has a very high bar, and the courts for many, many years many, many centuries have stated that, look, we need to have this quite high bar, otherwise everyone would rock up to the courts arguing all sorts of mental impairment to try to avoid themselves of liability under contract. Another area where capacity impacts on the underlying formation of a contract is with unincorporated societies. Now, clubs and societies under legislation in each of the states and territories can incorporate. When they do so, they essentially become like companies, they're corporate bodies capable of suing and being sued in their own name. Unincorporated societies, though, are groups of people, uh, again, that come together and have structures, usually management committees, and operate and run in many ways quite similarly to their 
are incorporated brethren, but they're not separate entities. They're not separate from the underlying members of that particular group. And so what the courts of common law do usually is that they will bind committee members where um, a person is purporting to enter into a contract on behalf of an unincorporated society. Another category or class of persons without full legal capacity are undischarged bankrupts. What happens there is that contracts can still be made by bankrupts, um, but there are certain types of contracts that they're not allowed to do, um, that they're barred by statute from doing. And if they do enter into one of those, the, uh, the innocent side usually gets the option to rescind or undo that contract. Um, also note that contracts that don't fall within those restricted categories can actually still be um, ratified or completed by the trustee in bankruptcy. We'll look in bankruptcy in much more detail in a subsequent screencast. This next element, which again can be named different things in different contexts, but for here we're going to refer to it as mutuality. And that is this idea that parties, when they enter into a contract, have to have a shared understanding of what the underlying subject matter is that they're dealing with. Um, now, the reason why this is difficult as an element is that there is actually a really low bar in terms of the underlying need for clarity and certainty in this shared understanding. The courts, for a long time, have really established themselves, almost quite proudly, as being the upholder of bargains. Courts will bend over backwards to ensure or try to um, construct a contract in such a way so that fundamentally the contract exists or the agreement is still in place. They are not readily destroying the underlying bargain between the parties. So as a result, where there's ambiguity, where there's uncertainty, the courts will construe things in such a way to try and resolve that. And again, the key part here is that they're looking at the underlying intention of, of what the parties wanted. When they came in to a time of formation, what was their objective intention? And that is the way that uh, the courts have historically treated contracts. And you know, from time to time, but again, although they try not to, where possible, they will interpret the contract in such a way if there are errors to just read through those um, if things have been misnumbered to ignore those where it's an obvious uh, error in terms of drafting and when things are contradictory or ambiguous from time to time to to actually strike out clauses in order to again maintain the contract and the almost sacrosanct nature of the bargain that the two parties come to The final area I want to just briefly talk about is legality. Now, it seems so obvious as to almost be tried that a contract to commit an overt crime, criminal offence, a crime, is not capable of any form of enforcement. You, you can't go to the courts and complain when your drug dealer ripped you off for a bunch of money and didn't give you your drugs. This is just not how our legal system works. However, there is you know, one famous case, um, supposedly from 1725, but it, it was been, it's been reported about in much, much later cases. So this may or may not have happened, but so the story goes, and Everett and Williams, two highwaymen, agreed to rob a series of carriages in England. And when they had a dispute, they'd agree between themselves that, look, they're going to go to the courts, and they got a lawyer to go to the courts to have the thing resolved, but they would talk about it in um, unusual language and so that they didn't want the, um, the judge to work out what was happening. The judge, of course, did work out what was happening, ordered the uh, highwayman to be hanged, and the judge, uh, so the, the lawyer to, he was originally sentenced to death, but I believe he got uh, transported out to the colonies as a result, um, because fundamentally, and look, this case still gets cited in contemporary judgments. Fundamentally though, 
you can't have contracts to commit crimes. It's not a contract. And if you do rock up and you go to court, those things are just not going to be upheld by the courts. However, it's not at all uncommon to have contracts where some aspect of the contract is in breach of some aspect of the law, be it um, other contractual duties, be it uh, other duties at common law or statutory duties. And again, from time to time, um, certain criminal uh, aspects can go on this as well. But the courts, at common law though, where you've got a contract which is fundamentally lawful, they're actually quite reluctant to strike out the contract as a whole. And this is why this element of legality, it's usually a minimal threshold, provided there's not some overt um, prohibition of the particular action. And this can be um, uh, often by statute saying you can't form contracts doing X, Y, or Z. Assuming that that's not the case, the courts are reluctant to um, to destroy the bargain. And so the, the way historically that the courts have looked at um, the issues of uh, illegality is to try to read the contract again in line with the objective intention of the parties and to try and maintain the existing structure of what the two parties came together to agree upon. So I hope this recording was useful and I look forward to the next few which are on the really important core areas of contract law on terms, on vitiating factors and on discharge.